So Pat, we're here today to look at a, a lagoon there that you've built. Uh, your business geoline, could you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, the company itself was formed 35 years ago. Um, we mainly started off doing uh, industrial works where we had lagoons for chemical companies, uh, general business. Then uh, we kind of sold the idea to the Department of Agriculture that uh, a line lagoon would be a, a good way and a, and a kind of a cost-effective way of storing agricultural slurry. So the business then gradually went into the agriculture sector and for lots of years we depended heavily on agriculture. And uh, at the same time then the general industry was, was growing too at the same time. That has kind of changed in recent years and the agriculture has become lesser uh, part of what we do and more, more general industry now takes up uh, more of our time. The agricultural window kind of is, is a small window between maybe April and September every year. And uh, so we put in the lagoons at, at that period along with everything else we do then in general industry. Okay. So um, say for farmers that are inquiring and ringing, say what are they looking for, say typically? What are their, their needs typically? Or yeah, so most farmers that ring me, their initial thing is that they, they need storage. The, they, in, in the current systems that they have, be it a combination of slatted tanks or above ground towers, uh, they're still short on, slow, uh, on storage capacity due to the numbers that they have. So they're kind of, a, a lot of the farmers are on leased land. They're kind of looking for a cost effective system that mightn't cost uh, the world and that uh, they may have to abandon in 15 years time or whatever. So that's why lagoons are an option for them. And most, mostly those guys now are looking for the bigger volumes and, and, and the smaller lagoon is probably not, not that existent anymore. Okay, so what size is typically are people looking at? Mainly starting off now at 500,000 gallons upwards. Yeah. And you know the sky is the limit. Uh, the other day there was one for 4.4 million gallons. So it's, it's wherever, any, anything in between really. And is that across all farming systems? Is it dairy, pig or whatever? Oh, just, just dairy mainly. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. We get the odd uh, pig related one. Sometimes it's a, it's a replacement from maybe a, a current system that they might have or something for pig, but mainly dairy. Okay. And so when a farmer does decide to go ahead, say, or when you go to your initial visit, what, what do you look at or what, what do you go through with the farmer? Yeah, first of all, we look at the site. So in this case, uh, when, I, when I met the, the farmer on this site, we looked at the site, the contours of the site, and to see exactly what way a lagoon would fit in. Some sites are dead flat, and this, this particular site is on a sloping site. So this, this one in particular slooped, uh, suited the, the, the construction method that we've done here with the, the built up embankments, which may, meant no material was drawn off site. Everything that was dug out of the hole was reused to form the embankments. Um, so I get the farmer's view on where he wants it, what will work best for him, so that we're not using up uh, land in, in a way that maybe makes it awkward for him to use the field. Then also we have to kind of bear in mind the layout of the farmyard and how they're going to get slurry to the lagoon. So in a lot of cases, farmers may well be scraping the slurry in over the top still. And so we have no choice but to put the lagoon along the edge of the yard, maybe in front of the sheds. Um, other cases, they can locate the lagoon totally out, out in a, a land bank where they may be drawing the slurry from the, the uh, maybe a catchment tank in the yard out to the fields and, and putting in a lagoon. So once, once it's agreed the location of where the slurry pit is, or where the slurry lagoon is going, uh, what happens next then is we mark it out on site um, once, uh, obviously I'll get drawings done up and everything to match the, the lagoon um, come to site, mark it out our civils crew will, will come on the same day um, basically we get going on, on bulk excavation Very good. Yeah. so on a situation like this, is a, this is a tillage farm and uh, it's possibly taken in pig slurry or, or maybe waste material and it's possibly something you'll see more of as well going forward with maybe a better emphasis on uh, using you know, slurry as a fertilizer and stuff like that. Yeah, there's a lot of, lot of lagoons now being built for that purpose and a, a lot of lagoons taken in brewery waste and, and, and things like that as well. Okay. And it, it, it's particularly high in, in, in whatever nitrogens and whatever the, that um, each particular waste, ha, you know, contains. So it, it's quite common for us now to get inquiries like that. And uh, it's put in the middle of a land bank. An umbilical system is used to spread all around it and it seems to be the, the most efficient way of doing it. So, okay. yeah. And say just maybe going through this particular project here, what size is this uh, lagoon here? Yeah, this lagoon is a, it's a half million gallon storage. So walking around the top of it, we're looking at a 30 metre by 30 metre measurement. It's 3.6 metres deep, so 12 foot deep. And um, this, this lagoon is, if this was in a dairy application, we'd be saying for, to size up your lagoon for a dairy, allow about three and a half thousand gallons per adult animal. 
and then you, you work out the size capacity that, that you need. Okay. Um, this lagoon is slightly different in that it's, it's, it's taken effluents and, 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 and waste products and stuff like that, and it's out in the middle of a land bank. Uh, so this one is uh, sized based on a known quantity that the client was going to store. And so as we're looking at the finished product here, there's tyres as well, what's the purpose of tyres? Yeah, the tyres are a safety measure. Um, again, referring back to S126, which is the department standard for lagoons, you have to have a tyre ladder every eight metres around the perimeter of the lagoon. Mainly it's for, you know, uh, if wildlife happen to get in, at least they have a method of escaping. The same for a person or something. If for some reason they had a reason to be between the fence line and the lagoon and they slipped in, they can grab onto a tyre and pull themselves out of it. Okay. So um, hopefully never, never needed, but yeah. they're, they're, they're there. And in this one, you have one access point then? Yeah, so uh, in a square lagoon like this, um, up to a half million gallons, we're comfortable that one mixing point is sufficient. If this was a half million gallons and it was more rectangular, you may well end up with two mixing points. Yeah. We find a mixing point will give, give us a, a kind of a, an agitation diameter of about 30 meters. So anywhere in, uh, in the middle of any one side here okay. was perfect for it. And the type of agitator, is that the one that goes in at the Yeah, the whisk. Yeah, whisk. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And uh, a lot of, lot of the whisks these days, some of them come with an auger on the shaft, which drives the crust down to the, to the blades. That's quite a good one. Okay, so the fence as well, you look after the fence? Yeah, well, we, we, right? yeah we look after everything, basically from digging right through to the fencing out, because we have to sign it off at the end. So the fence, the requirement on the fence, it has to be 1.8 metres high, so six foot high. And it has to be of, of a certain spec. So in this particular case, it's a three inch galvanised tubing four strands of bull wire, 1.8 metre high uh, chain link fence, and then a, a final row of barbed wire across the top okay. to comply. Yeah. And say indicative cost for somebody with a half a million gallons, roughly, what, what is the Yeah, cost in? in the last 12 months, due to COVID and everything, things have risen a bit. So at, at the moment, you're kind of looking at about 55,000 euros plus the VAT for a half a million gallons. Okay. And going to a million then, to roughly, or how? Yeah, you could uh, go up to maybe close on 80,000, depending on the shape and the mi and number of mis mi yeah. mixing points. Yeah. Perfect. So we have some footage of the construction process, okay. so we might just go through that that we gathered earlier in the year and just go through, I think, for people just to see how, how actually was this constructed and the various methods you used to, to make yeah. it all come together. No problem. Okay. So Pat, we have drawn footage here now, say, of uh, early days into the construction. Can you describe what's What's yeah, happening? so we're in the, in the middle of the bulk dig there at the moment, so uh, because it's a sloping site, uh, a lot of the material that's dug out of, of one side mainly is deposited then on, on three of the other sites, and that then is tracked in in, in layers, much like a lasagna, so every 300 mil the, the track machine will track across it, tighten up everything, and um, eventually laser level the top of the, the lagoon then, so that all four sides are dead level eventually when he, get, when he gets around to, to meet himself on, on, on the other corner. Okay, so this site here, you can see there's, there's good gravity material in there. Yeah. Uh, if this was some, in some other part of the country and you had uh, water coming at you again, or what, how would you handle this site? Yeah, water, water is, is a difficult one. We try, we try to, uh, you know, uh, in early days, if, if I, uh, during my initial site visit, I asked the farmer if there is a water issue, if he thinks that we're going to hit a water table issue, maybe at 3.6 metres deep. If there is a big water issue there, Sometimes we'll actually tell them straight out that the lagoon isn't suitable for that site, but um, most times we can incorporate the underfloor drainage system to take the groundwater out from underneath the lagoon and dig a drain down the field and get that groundwater off to a, a nearby ditch. Right. And that, that takes care of the, the uplift pressure from groundwater because we have to avoid that. Um, the types of soil that we encounter on some sites where we hit shale, we hit limestone, all sorts, um, every, everything can be worked with, we just have to be able to put a smooth surface on it. So basically with the, with the gravel material that we see on this site, that was a very good material and a very free drain, draining material. Um, so that, that, was, um, that was easy to work with. All we needed to do then was uh, to make that smooth. So what we're seeing now in the footage um, is uh, the pea gravel being delivered to site. So once the lagoon is fully shaped, uh, the leak detection system is, is inserted into the floor of the lagoon and what we need to do then is cover the floor of the lagoon in 75 mil deep of a 10 mil round washed pea gravel and that basically is a drainage media. 
So any possible groundwaters or whatever that might uh, gather underneath the lagoon liner, or if in the event that something happened to the lagoon liner and, and, and there was a catastrophe and something failed, that that drainage media will bring the either the groundwater or the effluent to the leak detection system underneath the lagoon, where then you will pick it up in the leak detection manhole outside the fence that we looked at. And if you didn't put in that material? You have to put it in because otherwise the liner will stick to the base and uh, the, the the groundwater or the, the effluent may not get to the leak detection system. Okay, what depth of? Uh, three inches three deep, inches. so 75 mil of it. Yeah. So now we're seeing here? Yeah, so before the, before the plastic gets laid then on the four sloping sides, uh, we save some of the topsoil from the initial strip of the site and we, we grade that to make sure that there's no stones in it. And we put topsoil on all the four side slopes and make it smooth with the back of the grading bucket on, on the track machine. And, um, and then it's ready for the plastic to be laid. So now you've the plastic laid here. What was involved with that? Yeah, so what we do, we bring a, a frame to site, which is a, a liner deployment frame. That connects onto the boom of the, the excavator. Uh, the roll of liner itself is, is uh, seven and a half metres wide and weighs a ton and a half. So the excavator will, will attach the frame with the, with the roll on it, lift it up in the air, and our guys then will manually pull strips of liner off the frame. So we try to generally go from one the slope right across the floor up the other slope with one full sheet and then once that's cut and put in place we do the same with the, the next sheet beside it two sheets are then overlapped by about six inches and then that allows us to start the automatic welding machine to weld the sheets together what weight are the sheets 7.5 meters okay. Okay, so what we're looking at here is, is uh, the outlet point here. Yeah, that's the outlet. That's, that's a sump in the floor. So the sump is about two foot deeper than the floor of the lagoon itself. And the lagoon is sloping towards that uh, sump end. So everything drains to that point. Um, so what we're looking at is a, a pipe coming up through the floor. And that will be cut off at a later stage down lower than what you're seeing there at the moment. And that, that pipe is welded to the floor liner. And we've created a kind of a dished area in the floor to, to create the sump. And, and the liner follows the contours of that dished area. And what we see at the moment there is, is one of my guys uh, welding uh, the, the liner. It's a kind of a hand welding process at that point. So when you get away from straight lines with the automatic welding machine, you have to use a hand welding process. Okay, so what are we seeing here now on this next part? So again, this, this guy now, is there's overlapping panels. That's uh, in the corner of a lagoon where you'd have straight sheets coming down, meeting each other, and one sheet will overlap the other. So what we have to try and create is a, 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 an even six inch overlap on, on the sheets of liner. So he's trimming off any excess material before he pops in the automatic welding machine. And there he is now. So he's after clamping in the automatic welding machine now on the overlap seam. And uh, what so you is this a heat process or what is it? Yeah, it's a heat process. So basically the, the machine itself is, is melting the plastic, uh, the, the underside of one sheet and the top side of the, the other sheet. And then as the, the welder passes over it, it fuses the two molten plastic sheets together. And in the centre, there's a, an air channel, which we'll use later on for testing to make sure that the weld was completed successfully. And this is self-propelled as such, is it? Self-propelled, yeah. 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 All, the, all the guy with it has to do is he, he cleans the liner in front. You see him doing that with the rag there now. And he just steers the machine to, to make sure it's, it's keeping on, on line. OK, so here now what the, what the man is doing, we have two different weld seams coming in at 90 degrees to each other. And, and both of those weld seams were, were completed with the automatic welding machine. So... Because they're, they're at 90 degrees to, to each other, the, the, that particular machine won't bond the two of them at that T-junction. So what we have to do is we have to prepare the material grind up with a hand grinder, grind off the shiny surface off the plastic itself. And we have to use a, a, a hand welding technique then to make a T-joint a at that particular point. So you'll, you'll probably see that come up later. There he is now with the hand welding machine. So what we see is a, a rod of plastic coming through the, the welder and as it passes through the welder it's heated up to about 230 degrees Celsius and it comes out the bottom of the welding machine as a, a molten plastic. Similarly in, in this footage um, he's using the same technique to weld the floor liner to the pipe that's coming up through the floor. And again the pipe is made of the same material as the lagoon liner itself. And this here what's he doing with this So that's, that's the testing. So before, the, before he completed that weld, he put a copper wire filament um, into the, the joint between the, uh, the pipe 
and the, the floor liner. And then he extruded the, the plastic over that copper filament. So now with, with that machine there, he's pumping electricity into the, into the weld seam. And if there's any defect whatsoever in that weld seam, um, a spark of what looks like lightning will pop out of the, the point where there's a defect. And if that did happen, we have to re-prepare that area again and re-weld it and then retest again. Okay, and, and the, this pipe here there, where he's hand on, do you cut that to the floor? How, how, yeah, how, the, that, you leave it? The, probably in this case, it was probably cut down uh, about another foot lower than what you see it there in that footage. Um, you could go straight to the floor if you wanted to. Um, some some cases, just best to leave it up a bit so you can leave some silt um, gather at the bottom of it. Yeah. So this is the second test method then. So with the automatic um, weld seam, uh, there's an air channel in the centre of it, so you see uh, on the picture two, the, the mark of two wheels, so that, that's a well seam underneath each wheel, and in, in between there's a, an open air channel. So what we do is we block both ends of the air channel with some extrusion weld, weld for, like you've seen on the previous welding machine, and we pump air into it. Uh, we pump that in at about three bar, and you leave it for about five minutes, you monitor the uh, pressure gauge the whole time. And if your pressure remains stable and there's no drop in it, um, that proves then that the weld seam is intact and that it's not going to uh, fail. We also do mechanical testing of it. So in, in, in the anchor trench, we might cut a little tab out of the weld seam and uh, we put it in a machine and actually pull the weld seam apart. And what we're looking for there is that the liner itself will fail before the weld. So the more welds there is in a lagoon, the stronger the lagoon will be. Um, the weld seam is the strongest part of it. So the lads are marking the pressure, you see they have 3.8 3 bar um, pumped up there and, and uh, the time frame as well as to how many minutes they left the test on for. So in terms of your, your process of construction uh, on the civil side, do you do the civil side or do you subcontract that or what aspect of that do you do? Yeah, I, uh, GLine have to control everything from start to finish because uh, we have to sign off the, uh, the, the job at the very end. So I use the one civil company all the time. Um, D. Dial and Sons, you see the, them on the machine there. Um, they come with me to all the lagoons, and um, he is a, technically a subcontractor to us, but um, he does all his work for us. So, what are they doing there then? So, the yeah, so what we're seeing there now is the, the lagoon liner is in, the testing has been done, the seams are passed off, so now it's, it's okay to backfill the anchor trench because around the top of every lagoon, there's a, an anchor trench that the plastic liner has to pop into. And that's about 600 mil deep. So he's filling in that now with the soil to stop any wind uh, taking away the liner out of the lagoon and to tighten up the liner in the lagoon. So we're looking here at uh, the lagoon. There is some material that's been dropped in, but say your tires there at the end, does, does, um, one is filled with concrete at the end on each of them. Why is that? Yeah, the, the main reason for the concrete um, is to keep the tire ladder in place. So particularly during agitation, the tires would have a tendency to move due to the uh, motion of the liquid when it's been agitated. So having the bottom, bottom concrete tire filled helps keep the ladder exactly in place and um, it's just a safe, safer method and it also prevents um, people from pulling them out. So was I, an, ob an obvious question from farmers or whatever is managing rainfall on, on, on say lagoons or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, so do you have covers for it or are they practical or, or what, what do you see in practice? Yeah, we, we have two cover systems available. Um, one of them is a complete cover, but it does depend on how you control your, your farming practices to actually get the, the liquid in and out of the lagoon. So the, the, the complete cover will, will mean that you won't get a drop of rainwater in there, but it does mean that you have to probably use um, an aeration system to agitate the, the slurry underneath, and you have to suck all your liquid in and out through um, a side slope riser pipe. That doesn't suit all, all uh, farms and particularly open farm yards where you're depending on scraping in over the top, that won't suit it. The second cover, we, ha we have a, a cover which basically we're, we're trying to uh, develop it to uh, kind of satisfy the department requirements on emissions and stuff. So what, what it does, it, it covers about 75% of the open area of the lagoon and, and it's on a kind of an elasticated bungee cord system so it floats up and down with the level of the liquid in the lagoon. It, it satisfies the, the, the purpose of reducing the emissions, but it doesn't stop any rain getting in, and, and, and you will still have the perimeter, which is exposed. I mean, our thought on it is that the, the crust on the slurry itself is nearly a better seal than any of these covers. In reality, I just have the slight little little worry that covers, um, particularly the, the one that's on the bungee cord system, may not be 
uh, a fully safe system, and uh, you know if if um, if they if they would maybe not put in that cover system, maybe the department would, might be a better thing for the department to kind of consider. You know. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say that the department as well, and their views recently I've heard is it's it, they're more concerned um, about keeping the wind directly off the surface of the lagoon as opposed to the rainfall going in. So it's trying to create a, a barrier or, or say a bank an embankment around the top of the the lagoon to keep the, the direct wind off it. Which is, um, you know, which is a lot easier to construct oh, as yeah. opposed to putting in a cover. Definitely, and we're going to have the in, in in a lot of cases we have excess soil created, particularly in lagoons that are built on flat land. There's lots of soil left over, so if we can create some sort of a mounding around it with some of that soil, it's it's good, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a practical. There are practical solutions to yeah. solving that. Yeah. So Pat, with the the lagoon here and the, the height advantage that you had above. Um, one option here, obviously, is for the the tanks or um, you know biblical system, say, to pull up here yeah. and for the farmer to connect here. Could you describe what we're looking at here? Yeah, so basically this is the, the outlet point for the, the, the lagoon itself. So we have a pipe in the floor of the lagoon, which is basically allowing that lagoon to totally drain down so that there's absolutely no liquid left in it. Gravity will force the slurry from the lagoon to this point. And what we're looking at here then is a triple valve system. So basically we have two standard slurry knife valves yeah. and uh, they would normally be in service uh, on a, on a full-time basis so you have dual protection and then we have uh, a third valve beside it and the idea of that valve is that you can tighten down that valve and replace out any of the other two knife valves right. if ever any of them fail in the future. Right. So the tanker then or the umbilical system or the pump would just connect onto that uh, the bower end, uh, open the knife valves and gravity is just pushing the slurry straight out to the system straight away. Right. Um, no diesel really used to suck slurry up out of a deep lagoon or anything, so it's an efficient way of doing it. Yeah, to probably fill a tank too if you want to... Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so with the wall then, the wall, what is that doing? The wall is really just holding everything in place. Yeah. It's, it's just a kind of a head wall just for um, stability. Okay. And then we have a kind of a resting plate underneath it as well. There's a concrete slab on the base there, resting plate on it that stops the the valve system was cantilevered out so we stop it from waving around. Okay, would you do say a solution like this on many of your jobs? Probably about 20% of the lagoons okay. to put them in. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't suit every land because it, it suits this, this property great because it's on a slope and then you're using the natural slope to get the, the gravity line working for you. Okay. If you're on a flat field it wouldn't work as, as well really. Okay. So yeah. they don't tend to put them on. Yeah. So what size pipe then is feeding from the lagoon? So it's a, a six inch pipe or a 150 diameter pipe and they're all six inch valves. They're all, all mainly termed in imperial measurements six inch as such. So, um, and that then matches up with the, the connection points on the tankers and the pumps. So we keep it matching. Okay, and is that a solid pipe from yeah. here to Lagoon? It's a fully welded, so the, the pipe that you see, that black pipe, it's a, it's a polyethylene pipe, high density polyethylene pipe, that's a, the same material that the liner in the Lagoon is made of. Mm. So when that pipe then, it, it's, it's welded in 12 metre sections, and when it comes into the Lagoon, we weld the pipe to the Lagoon liner. Okay. So there's no possibility whatsoever that the leak can happen at that point. Okay, great, perfect. Pat, what are we looking at here in the manhole? Yeah, this is the leak detection manhole. Part of the requirements from the department with the S126 specification is that you must have a leak detection manhole. So the council or any, any state body, anybody at all can come, lift the manhole cover, take a sample of the liquid in the bottom of the manhole and take it off for testing. And, and the idea is to prove that the lagoon itself isn't leaking and that any, any liquid that's under there would only be groundwater and not contaminated with, any, with anything. Right. So that's the main purpose of it. So on the design here, when you designed it, everything is draining back to this point here? Yeah, so the, the leak detection system on, on, in, in the floor of the lagoon all comes back to a, an extract pipe which comes through the embankment and uh, when you lift that cover, there's a, a vertical shaft manhole going down and that pipe connects into that manhole okay. and then there's a further one metre drop below that again, which is all filled with uh, groundwater or whatever liquid okay. that might come in there from, yeah. from the ground itself. Yeah, perfect, great. So Pat, we're up in the bank here now, and um, looking back down, say at the output below, there's a significant uh, height difference. Yeah. Roughly, what is there? There's about 3.3 meters in the difference of the lagoon floor. Say so the lagoon floor and that pipe are roughly equal, maybe maybe 300 mil in the difference, and then where we're standing, 3.3 meters difference in height. So yeah. you have that much head of pressure then forcing the slurry down to that point. Yeah, very good, and that's great. It's significant pressure then on the. Yeah. For the yeah, you yeah. mean you can completely drain the lagoon from that point and uh, gravity does the work for you. Yeah. So Pat, in terms of, uh, you know, people are going to look at concrete or they're going to look at 
plastic line lagoons and they're going to ask about durability. Um, what's the lifespan on this or say guarantees can you give? Yeah, well, the Department of Agriculture require us to give a 30 year guarantee on it. That's, that's a minimum. Um, the lifespan of that material itself, the manufacturers at the moment will say they'll definitely stand over 50 years plus. In reality, they reckon 300 years is the lifespan of that material. It's just unaffected by anything. Even in the chemical industry, it's unaffected by most chemicals. I suppose what we see in our design services, we're getting more and more calls. Um, maybe as the expansion slows down, slurry storage is obviously the big crossword. People that might have been at 16 weeks have to go to 20, 20 to 24 and so on. So um, are you seeing an increase in inquiries, say, in general? Yeah, definitely in the last six months, there's a lot of increase. Um, in, in the previous two years, maybe during the, the early parts of uh, COVID and everything, the inquiries had dropped uh, a good bit, and, and mainly that was due to the fears about the covering of lagoons and everything. Uh, but in the last six months, the inquiry levels have really started to, to rise again, and it's guys looking for storage because they're, they're, they're under pressure with their current facilities and that's that's mainly the gist of what, what uh, the nature of them are at the moment. Yeah, and so from your base in Waterford, are you cover, covering the country? Or? We cover the country, all 32 counties and uh, we even do lagoons in the UK as well but uh, most of our work is um, if you draw a straight line across from maybe Loud across to, to Galway, below that is, is where most of the lagoons get put in. Yeah, and it's probably no harm for farmers who are interested to know, like, it is a kind of a seasonal job, like, you, you probably need to be talking to people out of season to be prepared for the season, could you just... Be yeah, people really need to be talking to us early in the year, particularly because they have to go through the planning process, and that, that'll take three months before you... And that's all going well before they can actually get the digger on the ground. So if they're looking at doing the, the job in the summertime when the, the weather is dry, they want to be getting going you know, early in the year. And then most lagoons will take, this one, for example, takes about five weeks to do start to finish. And most lagoons, even up to one, one and a half million gallons, will be done in that similar time frame. So they want to allow for that and then with a view to when their animals are coming back in uh, for the winter that they have their lagoon up and running yeah. by that time. Okay, so you have a website where you can see all your... Yeah, everything is on uh, geoline.ie and there's an agricultural section on that there and, and that should take you through step-by-step -step yeah. process of it. Okay. Very good. And thanks for your time here today. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you.